today is going to be broad vocabulary, implementing alternate vocabularies for improved access and description. Your presenter is Rachel Searcy from New York University. New York University employs Library of Congress subject headings for its breadth of topics, but also recognizes its inherent biases, slow nature to change, and conceptual gaps for specific areas. Focused subject terms lists such as medical subject headings or homosaurus provide opportunities to address gaps in concepts, address the damage done by harmful subject headings, and ultimately enhance the discovery of archival collections. This presentation will focus on the implementation of alternate vocabularies using our test suite, including a practical overview of system functionality, local policy considerations, an examination of the role of controlled access points alongside narrative archival description, and an affirmation that we are responsible for our metadata and its impact on our staff and users. Rachel? Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so today, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about some of the work we're undertaking at NYU to address uh, harmful subject headings through the use of alternate vocabularies in archive space. I'm gonna get, give a bit of a practical overview of the subject record functionality and talk about our local policy decisions, but I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the role of controlled access points alongside narrative archival description. Okay. Uh, I asked my boss, I was like, do you think I can make this picture a metaphor for controlled vocabularies? And she was like, hmm, just sort of a nice way of saying no, but I'm still going with it. So um, at NYU, we employ the Library of Congress subject headings, or LCSH, as a general default for access points to our collections. It's a multidisciplinary vocabulary that includes headings for a vast breadth of topics. So at its best, it gathers together variant terms to support subject-based browsing across provenance-based collections with the ultimate goal of access. But we also recognize Library of Congress's inherent biases, the institution's slow and in many cases reluctant nature to revise the vocabulary, and the conceptual gaps that exist for specific areas. There is an inherent tension between attempting to fix a concept into a single expression and the dynamic nature of language. And that's going to be a challenge for any controlled vocabulary. But there are some systemic problems at the heart of the Library of Congress and how it maintains the vocabulary, including the adherence to literary warrant, privileging the experience of dominant identities, and an eroding sense of trust with the larger cataloging community. From Sanford Berman to change the subject, bias subject headings have been a long simmering problem. So at NYU, we're looking for an approach that leverages the benefits of controlled vocabularies while empowering us to more fully exercise our professional judgment and centering equity in our descriptive decision making. Um, in recent years, we've made concerted efforts to re-examine our archival practices through the lens of anti-racism. We've done discrete reparative description projects, revised our processing manual in an effort to decenter whiteness and address silences, and instituted policy changes uh, to improve transparency about the interventions we take in our collections. Authority work is yet another part of this effort as we look to re-examine how we assign controlled access points, what vocabularies we use, and our role in creating name records in the name authority file. Uh, we had a handful of known problem uh, terms that were already on our mind, uh, but we also figured that because of the systemic problems I mentioned earlier, we probably had more problematic terms than we realized. At that time, we had 9,328 archive space subject terms. And these are the terms that our colleagues and users are encountering and that are potentially causing painful or uncomfortable experiences for them. So we created an Airtable base with all of our subject terms and identified 170 in this first pass that were problematic in some way, but there are likely more to address. Um, this can happen in waves or as collections come up in the course of accessioning or processing. We're trying to do what we can, when we can, and always be open to doing more. Uh, we observed some clustering of problematic terms around a few topics. They are uh, crime, gender and sexuality, housing and poverty, uh, immigration, which I realize I forgot to put on here, um, indigeneity, race and ethnicity, and default identities. We also identified three tracks to address these issues. There isn't gonna be a one-size-fits-all approach. Some terms have a clear and obvious replacement in an alternate vocabulary. Others will require additional research and or collaboration with our colleagues. And that could be because there isn't a great term available for us in another vocabulary, 
or it could be that we need to learn more about the specific collection it's applied to and determine if it's maybe a term that's appropriate for one collection but not another. We also have some terms that will be best addressed through local practice rather than using different vocabularies. So we started with that first category, the one-to-one -one replacements, because it's the most straightforward. So enter alternate vocabularies. I'm gonna talk about just a few today, but there are hundreds supported by Mark, and it really depends on the needs of your collections and users. Uh, I'm gonna talk about Mesh and Homosaurus. Uh, we chose them because we felt like they could help us with some of our known issues. Uh, medical subject headings, or Mesh, is maintained by the National Library of Medicine and is used for biomedical and health-related resources. It's well-established, in high use, albeit for specialized resources, and regularly maintained. While we don't use most of the terms in this vocabulary, uh, we don't have a need for terms about specific diseases or medications, we have found that the category for groups of people is not perfect, but reliably a bit more progressive than LCSH. Homosaurus is a linked data vocabulary of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer terms that support, supports improved access to LGBTQ plus resources, provides alternatives to harmful subject headings and other vocabularies, and addresses conceptual gaps concerning gender and sexuality in those broader vocabularies. Um, it's currently maintained by the Digital Transgender Archive. We have a number of collections documenting LGBTQ plus art and activism, and have long been dissatisfied with many of the terms applied to these collections, or the absence of particular topics that we wanted to highlight that were just not available in LCSH. So how does one implement another vocabulary exactly? Uh, there are two parts, the functional implementation and then local usage. Uh, the first is simple and something that you can do in the stack interface if you have the right permissions. So to do that, you go to system, manage controlled le value list, and then select the list that you want. So um, let's see. So here we want the subject source list. Um, this is actually one of my favorite tips for leveling up in archive space. Uh, most of the times when you see a drop down list, that's something you can usually modify. So. So here we see some of our sources for subject headings. Uh, Mesh is actually already in there as a default, but um, let's say that we wanted to add Homosaurus. So I'm gonna click on that Create Value button, and then I wanna put the source code for the vocabulary as assigned by Library of Congress. So this identifies the vocabulary in a machine-readable way. So let's see where I'm at. So now the new term is in the system, but it doesn't look quite right on the top. Um, and we want it to look like, oh, the slides cut off. Um, there we go. We want it to look like that on the bottom. So to do that, um, if you are locally hosted, you'll wanna go in the file with all of those values and translations. Looks like this. Um, but if you're, and then actually, sorry, so that's what that file sort of looks like. It has the value and then the translation for what you're gonna see in the staff interface. Um, if you're using a service provider, I imagine you can just ask them to update that for you. So that's, that's the system functionality side. The more complicated part is how you use an alternate vocabulary. And here's where I will tell you that I am not a cataloger. Um, when we were implementing Mesh and Homosaurus, we needed to learn how these vocabularies operate what their organizing principles are, and what rules govern their usage. So for example, can you use subdivisions? If so, which ones, and in which order? Um, Mesh, in particular, has really helpful documentation on their site. Um, but of course, there are rules, and then there's local application of them. There's still individual judgment, as well as the unique needs of individual collections. So um, let's look at the subject record as a record type in archive space, and see where some of these decisions show up. So um, the fields with the red stars are required, so we need those. But um, right away we see that we have some other options available to us. Do we want to use the authority ID field or not? What about the scope note? Um, it's worth thinking about if and how you might want to use these fields. And we'll use them differently for one vocabulary versus another. Um, we decided to make the authority ID field optional for all subject records, regardless of which vocabulary they come from. But if we do use them, uh, it needs to be specifically formatted. 
Otherwise, we get validation errors in connection. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, not COVID. Um, the scope field is interesting. It's not something that we typically use when working with subject records. But we did decide to use it when we use an alternate vocabulary to replace or avoid a specific term from LCSH. So in these circumstances, we write something to the effect of like, this term is intentionally used as an alternative to an LC term. So we do that for a few reasons. One is that if an archive space user is searching for that term full string, this alternative will show up for them in the staff interface. Um, another reason, sorry, is for um, transparency in our decision making. We have a lot, a lot of legacy data from a time when folks did not have much training on subject records or subject headings. And so we know that we still have a lot of incorrect, obsolete, or see also references instead of authorized headings. And so um, we wanted to leave enough of a trail of decision making here so that if someone comes across this heading, they'll understand that it was created and applied with intention. So once you make uh, these decisions, you wanna document them for yourself to help with consistency. Sorry, I have something in my throat. <coughs> so um, I'll also note here that uh, at NYU, we do not use the public user interface. We export our EAD and MARC records in order to publish finding aids and catalog records. Um, oh, thank you. Um, this subject scope note does not export into either of those uh, files, but if you are using the PUI, um, please note that this um, subject scope, scope note is publicly viewable. So that's just something to factor into when uh, making these local decisions. So uh, with all that in mind, I just wanna talk about one collection to so show some of the, these ideas in practice. We have the records of GAPIMNI, a volunteer-led community organization for queer and trans people of Asian Pacific Islander descent in the New York area. We first received their records in 2015, and at that point, the group's name was an acronym that stood for Gay Asian Pacific, Pacific Islander Men of New York. Over time, uh, the group has changed both in name, uh, GAPIMNI is now no longer an acronym, and now really works to center queer and trans folks. So when we received an accretion in 2021, we needed to make some changes to the descriptor front rat matter to reflect that shift. Um, but it also gave us an opportunity to revisit the subject terms. The organization changed its name for a reason, and we wanted to represent their work through our descriptive records as faithfully and respectfully as possible. We asked if they were interested in talking with us about this, and they said yes, but that they were also busy. So um, sometimes, often in fact, this collaboration can take time. We had two main questions of the subject records previously applied to the collections. Which ones did they want to keep, if any? So they marked those up for us. Um, we said we'd also like to add terms related to activism, community, and discrimination, but for that, each of these, we had a choice to make. We could use a very specific term, like queer activism, um, or we could use a broader term, like LGBTQ plus activism. And so we made it clear to them that we were happy to do either, um, but that, if possible, we'd like to be consistent. And they told us that um, those larger, broader umbrella terms made more sense to them. We had an additional wrinkle. So a few of the original uh, LCSH applied to the collection described groups of people in pejorative ways. Why describe people by what they are not, rather than who they are? At that point in time, um, Homosaurus had a term for Asian American LGBTQ plus people, but not one for Pacific Islander American LGBTQ plus people. Um, excuse me one second. Sorry about that. Um, I couldn't find much information on how new terms get added. So I sent them an email basically saying what I've already said here, and I didn't know what to expect. I had just been through a long, confusing, and ultimately unsuccessful LCSH change proposal for something else. So it was such a change of pace when I got an email back quite quickly that was basically like, that's a great idea, we'll add it, anything else you want? Um, so very quickly, this new term was available in the vocabulary. We applied it to the collection, and it was, um, 
be really great to come back to the donor to say like, we've made some revisions thanks to your input. And also there's this new term that is not only available for your collection, but that other libraries can use. Okay, I'm getting to the end. Uh, <laughs> so this collection is an encapsulation of a lot of things. It's um, an application of different vocabularies, of iter iterative description, how accessioning affords opportunities to return to collections and revisit our description of them, and collaboration between archivists and donors. It's also a great example of the complementary nature of narrative description and controlled vocabularies. So if you remember, this organization changed its name to focus on queer and trans people, but the donor recommended um, that we use broad subject terms like LGBTQ+. And so while those controlled access points are broad, in the scope note, in the, in the historical note, we can add more nuance to really highlight that focus and provide that shading. I think it's also a great example of how much power and choice we actually have. Um, so if we don't like the options in one vocabulary, we can use another. We can do something different with subject terms than we do with free text description. We make these decisions based on what we know about the collection, the creators, the record subjects, and our users. And while I don't expect to be successful every time I ask for a new term, it's also worth remembering that sometimes I will be. Okay, so we've done some good work so far and there's still a lot we can do. Of those original 9,328 terms, we identified 170 we had issues with. And we've already addressed 51 of those. Here are just a few of the terms we've changed and their replacements. Um, but like I said, we have more work to do. We have a lot of terms that there isn't an exact one-to-one -one replacement available or where a term might be appropriate for one collection but not another. So these are gonna take time, collaboration, and decision making. So just to wrap things up with a few parting observations and lessons learned, if you're wondering where to start, I would say start with your collections and the issues you already have on your mind. Um, I'd also recommend limiting yourself to a small number of vocabularies. Take the time to get to know them, how they operate, and how you want to use them. You should also consider long-term maintenance. Terms can and will change. Uh, next, there's no perfect vocabulary. They're all created by people, and we all have our biases. And lastly, you know, it's good to know what Library of Congress is up to, even when you look elsewhere. I think there's value to a uh, Library of Congress as a vocabulary, and I am in favor of change proposals and new term proposals. But I'm also not gonna hold my breath, and I'm not gonna plan my actions around big statements that they might make, especially those without timelines or accountability. So for example, in March, they announced that they're changing the subject term slaves to enslaved people, which is great, but as of this morning, it still has not gone into effect. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope this was interesting or helpful if you've ever wondered about alternate vocabularies and how we use them. Um, all that being said, at the end of the day, we're responsible for our metadata and its impact on staff and users. And we do have the ability to mitigate some of the damage caused by harmful or inaccurate headings. Or in the case of newly created metadata, we have choices to avoid using harmful terminology. Um, in many ways, archives and archivists often have much more freedom to do so than some librarians, both in terms of the systems that we use, like archive space, um, but also because of the nature of archival description. Archival collections do not come with title pages and subject headings already assigned to them. We do not get vendor records. We create description using our professional judgment. So um, I have my email on here as well as the link to our LibGuide where we have all of our archive space documentation. Our local manual, which is on that site, includes a section on how we use alternate vocabularies. So please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, we have, I ran a little late in getting started, so we have about three minutes for questions. Rachel, are you open to taking questions? <laughs> She's like, no, just email me. <laughs> um, so what we'll do, we only have one microphone, so I will be the runner. If you have a question, raise your hand, I'll run to you, and then I'll run the microphone back to you. So we'll probably only have time for, for one or two questions, but I also noticed that someone, maybe Rachel, put remediating subject and agent records on the suggestion board. Oh, okay, well. 
Uh, yeah, so th maybe that's a topic we can talk about. I'd love to hear about your failed proposal. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so any anyone have a, a brief question? Okay. It's easier when it's Zoom, right? Because you can like type the question out and think about it and not be the first person to put something in the chat. <laughs> All right, I'm coming to you. Yeah, I know. Why do you have to be over there? <laughs> Hi, uh, Dan Michelson, Smith College, um, and uh, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on um, ways in which the subjects module, which is very limited in archive space, um, ways it might be improved to sort of make this kind of work easier. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I haven't really thought about it too in depth, um, but you know, just kind of thinking about like what, like a subject record, like a subject authority record looks like, might be a place to start. <coughs> in terms of like variant terms or display terms, um, you know, because we do like exporting rather than the TUI, but like that might be a way to kind of alleviate some issues if like, you know, you're, you want a particular concept, but don't like the actual like label, but like maybe like the 450, one of the 450s like to use something like that um, is sort of like top of mind one of the ideas I had, but, um, but I think it is worth exploring because yeah, in comparison to some of the other subject records, it's quite simple, so there may be room to kind of um, build that functionality in to kind of help with this. Thanks, Rachel. I'm gonna go ahead and give you a reprieve so you can have some water. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like this is probably gonna be something we discuss later and, and Rachel did share her email address. Um, so yeah, thanks again, Rachel. We're gonna go ahead and move into our next presentation for the day. Let me pull those up.